Dear friends, welcome back to this latest episode of the podcast series, The Way Out Is In. I am Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems evolution. And I am Brother Fab Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk, a student of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh in the Plum Village tradition. And today, brother, we're going to be talking about death. Most people are terrified of dying because there's a belief that death is annihilation, that you're alive one moment and then nothing is left on you. And then also people are very fearful of losing their loved ones because they feel that once their loved one dies, then they'll be bereft, there'll be nothing left to live for. And hopefully, as I say, by the end of this recording, Brother Fapu, you will have given us the value of the teachings of the Buddha on this subject that can help us to relax, take it easy, and enjoy life. The way out is in. Welcome, dear friends. I am Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fab Hu. And Brother, as I said, we are going to be talking about death today. Big topic. Big topic. And as I said, Brother, a lot of people, their biggest fear of living during their life is that they're going to die. And that there's the sense that, um, that once you die, you lose everything of value that you've ever had. Help us understand what the Buddha's teachings on this subject. Death is a contemplation because life is there, death also is there. And we can look at the original source of the fear of death. And one explanation that I received from Thay's Dhamma talk that made me, gave me this realization was when we were born, that was a moment that was very difficult for both child and mother. We can hear from our mothers or our friends who give birth. They can share and explain also the wonders of having a child, n- nourishing, nurturing it, as well as the moment of, of birth. And we know how difficult it can be. Even the Buddha himself lost his mother at birth because that moment is a very critical moment. And that moment as a human being, we are going to take our first breath outside of our mother. There's that moment when you have to eject the liquid from within you in your lungs and you have to take that first breath as a child, as a living being outside of your mother. And so that is a moment of life. That's a moment of being a part of this world. So there is this miraculous moment. That's why we always say that to be alive is a miracle because it's not simple. We, a lot of us who are living now, we think that, yes, our parents came together and boom, we're there. (laughs) And and I think that um, coming with being a human, there is a lot of attachment. There's the attachment of love, attachment of tenderness, of care that we had when we were in the womb of our mother. And so maybe that's why a lot of um, child are so close to their mother at the beginning because there's that deep interconnection between the mother and the child from the moment of manifestation. And so we are also inherited by this longing for warmth, this longing for belonging, this longing for an attachment. And so that attachment now is translated into life, into many things. And as we live our world, we gain more and more attachment. And we can say that a lot of our greed, a lot of our striving for power, striving for existence, striving for love, is all to feel connected 
because we are afraid of non-existent. We are afraid of being nothing, being no one, because we have already just overcome this moment to be alive. And so we can say that this is a suffering, the suffering in the form of fear. And it translates within our life in grasping for something, in discriminating, in wanting more because we feel that that makes us who we are. So the teaching of Buddhism is to be free, to be liberated, to transcend our suffering. And suffering needs a name. So here we can say the fear of death is the name of suffering. And part of our Plum Village practice, first of all, we have to become aware that we are alive first. A lot of us may be living, but we don't know that we are living. We are in autopilot all the time. We are running after a position, running after a desire, even maybe running away from fear or running with fear. And it's pushing us in so many directions. And we can say that we're actually maybe not so alive as we think we are. And so the teachings, first of all, of Plum Village is to learn to come home with the mind to the body in the present moment. Because for us, in the present moment, this, this is the teaching of the Buddha, in the present moment, this is where life is. The past is gone. The future is not yet there. There is only one moment that you can be alive, and that is the present moment. And so if we are allowing ourselves to be more and more alive, we can practice and have time to cultivate the insight of non-fear and to look at death as a reality Because in the teaching of Buddhism, there are five remembrance that uh, Thai has translated into our um, language. That is, we are of the nature to grow old. We cannot escape growing old. I am of the nature to have ill health. There is no way that I can escape ill health. I am of the nature to die. There is no way that I can escape death. All that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There is no way to escape being separated from them. Let's take a pause there and we'll come to the fifth remembrance a little bit later. But this teaching, these first four remembrance teaches us of the insight and the teaching of impermanence, that everything that is here today, one day is of the subject to change. And change can be a form or change can be of manifestation. And the language we use is that we are not exactly a creation. There, there, there's a lot of belief that, you know, we come from nothing. Suddenly we just, boom, you're here. But the deep teaching of Buddhism and the deep looking in meditation is to see the manifestation of life. You are a manifestation. It's not that suddenly from nothing you become someone. If we take this moment and we meditate on our own self, we can see that inside of us, there are elements of our father. There are elements of our mother. Our parents had to come together for us to manifest. That is a condition. We call this condition. And then that is just one of the condition. And then our mother had to nurture us. And in this time, we are already interbeing, we are already interconnecting. So even as a manifestation, we are not exactly separated from all the conditions that nourish us. And then once we're born, then we start to grow up. We need 
the environment, we need nature, we need to breathe. We are also a child of the earth because we rely on the oxygen, we rely on the sunshine, and even the elements that are around us, such as our loving parents or an environment that may not be so loving, that also will impact us and change us and will create our consciousness, create our being. And so we start to dissect ourselves with meditation. We start to see the different elements that make us who we are. So even looking at our tradition, our culture, where do you grow up in? You will be influenced by that. And then our parents' history, they will also transmit to us their greatest joy, their greatest happiness, their greatest insight that they may have had in life, and also transmit to us maybe some of their deepest suffering that they haven't transformed. And maybe even their fear, their despair, we also get this inheritance. And that's from our closest ancestor, which is our parents. And even deeper in our meditation, we can see that we receive also from our ancestor. And then going even beyond our community that is around us, our society, our nation, the world that we are in, depending on what era we are born in, all of this is a part of us. So in our meditation, we start to see the non-self element of oneself. Because we identify with a self, I am Joe Confino, I am Brother Fabhu. I'm afraid I will not be Brother Fabhu. I'm afraid I will not be Joe Confino. But if we look with that eye, then can you really identify yourself as an individual? But deeply, we know that we cannot be by ourselves. We have to interbe with all of these other conditions for us to manifest. So this is a meditation to help us, first of all, see that we are not separated from everything. It's because of the notion, the idea that I am an individual, a creation that is just, this is who I am. Nothing else affect me. That is a wrong view in Buddhism. That is a wrong view that we have to learn to remove. And we may get this insight that I am sharing. You may start to realize, ah, yeah, that makes sense. But once you start living, can you remove yourself of this ego, of this pride in daily life? That is where the practice come in. And our practice, the question that Tai is asked sometimes is what happens when you die? Tai likes to reverse it. And his question comes as a bell of mindfulness to all of us. What happens when you are alive? Answer me. Tell me. Beautiful. And brother, just, just to track back to the start of your conversation. So one of, one of the things is that people shouldn't feel in any way bad about fearing death because what you're saying is actually at this moment of birth that is the original fear that we are separated from this deep sense of security this deep sense of belonging and we're sort of in a sense ripped out from that and have to exist and and have to survive on our own so so this this sense of separation is actually something everyone experiences, isn't it? It's not something that some people get and some people have this easy path in. Actually, everyone has to take that journey. So it immediately creates that fear of separation. So I think that's one thing to say, well, actually, it's very natural in one sense to have that fear. And then that fear gets sort of built into it by our society and especially in the West where this sense of individualism and I've got to get what I can. And so it builds up this whole idea of separation. And that separation then is, leads to grasping, which is uh, if I'm on my own, I've got to protect myself and I've got to 
amass enough security in terms of money or or in terms of um, my career or whatever. So actually, you can see this journey, how easy it is for people to actually create this idea that they are separate and whatever. And, and what I love about uh, the five remembrances and, and the, the fourth one is that we're going to lose everything that is of value to us. So, so it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? There's the sense of we spend our lives amassing things, but we know that actually we're going to lose everything of value because we're going to actually at the end be separated from everything when we die. And actually that sort of makes sense then that while we're living, we should be in community with everyone because actually when we pass into another realm, we will actually lose those direct connections. So in a sense, we've got it a bit the wrong way around, haven't we? It seems that way. And I think this is what um, Tai has been trying to introduce, re-educate in a way. This, um, this idea of instead of being afraid of death, be happy about life. And Tai always says um, a, lot, a lot of the Dhamma talks, he would start breathing in, I know I'm alive. Breathing out, I am happy. Breathing in, I recognize life inside of me and all around me. So this is like to reinsert this notion of death is part of life. You shouldn't spend your years to be afraid of it because if you do, you're going to arrive at it anyways. There's no point in running away from death. Um, it's a part of being human. It's a part of being a manifestation of this earth. And what we have to learn to, to do is to live life with the insight of impermanence. Like, as, like what you shared, fear is an original sense. It is one of the mental formations that we all have. And it's not to suppress it. It's not to push it away. But we can, we can soothe our fear. We can offer it insight we can allow mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness, of being alive to make our life more meaningful, more rich. Just like you said, if one day we, are, we will say goodbye to our dearest friends, our, our partner, our parents, our grandparents, our, even our children, if we have this insight, don't wait to that moment to be sad and to celebrate their life. We should be celebrating life in every moment. And this is the key of mindfulness. Mindfulness gives us this awareness that life is here and we should be here. And especially, brother, it, it's rather, you know, when, when you stand back from this, it's rather bizarre because when we look out in the world, everything we see manifests and demanifests, you know, a, a tree, a flower, you know, the weather, um, you know, countries, civilizations. I mean, literally, there's not a single thing that isn't constantly in flux. The earth is in flux. The, the universe is in flux. Literally, everything is moving. And yet we have this sort of desperate wish to hang on to things being the same. I mean, it, it's, it's a rather extraordinary um, state of affairs of, that we put ourselves in the very point of suffering yes. because when we let go and say actually i am part of everything everything's in flux i'm in flux and we start to settle into that then actually we're flowing with life rather than trying to build a dam against life exactly and i think if we have this insight we will stop pushing ourselves and we'll stop running after more desire more power more um possessions um, because if we keep running after that, do we have time to be alive? Do we have time to enjoy what we have? And that's why Tai sometimes has this calligraphy, you have enough, that's it. And that's to remind us that, are you always running after something? Are you sure that grasping whatever it is in the future going to bring you happiness? Because if you're going to keep running towards the future, what you arrive at is death, is your, 
your plague. <laughs> I remember one time I drew a line, and he said, uh, "If you don't live life, you will just arrive at D, which is death. And why, why, why waste your time to be fearful and to run after that, and then arrive there? But what we are offered this very moment is a chance to be alive, and so." With this insight and with this um, deep looking, we can start to translate it into our life. So, if we are healthy now, you know, Tai has very simple meditations that Tai tells us to learn to be happy with the simplicity of life. Every morning, you wake up, and you can look at the trees. You can see your loved ones. You can. Look at all the colors that the leaves offer you. If you don't know how to enjoy that, do you think after death you will enjoy it? Do you think in the kingdom of God or in the pure land you will enjoy it? If you can't do it now, do you think that after you die you can do that? If you your aspiration is to go to the kingdom of God or to the pure land of the Buddha, and this is not to. Criticize uh, a thought of like what happens after you die, but in the Plum Village teaching and the teaching of Thai, it always brings back to the present moment, because to Thai, planet Earth is the pure land of the Buddha. Planet Earth is the kingdom of God. If you look at a flower and you look at it deeply, you see that. All of these conditions that have come together for it to manifest, that is a wonder of life. And if that wonder of life doesn't belong in the pure land of the Buddha or in the kingdom of God, where does it belong? So we start to see that the simplicity of life are wonders. I had the the chance of being close to Tai, and I can see in his way of being. When he drinks his cup of tea in the morning, he drinks it with this insight that this cup of tea is a gift. This is where you practice impermanence, because if you enjoy this cup now, it may be your last one. You never know. You can't bargain with life and death. Sometimes it comes unexpected, and so you start to have this new lens. Of way of looking at life, you start to be with your friends, you be with your loved ones in a more deeper sense, and you start to share more beautifully. Why waste your time at at uh, arguing when at one day we will not be here anymore? Taiwan said, "If you're so angry at someone, meditate on that person and see that person in one hundred fifty years." He may not be here anymore. She may not be here anymore. So, is it worth it to always be angry at that person? Because if we are all of the nature to one day return back to the earth, let us live in a more loving way. Let us live with more embrace, more connection, which we are longing for. Yeah, I remember when I was young, and before I knew anything about Buddhism, I always remember seeing this phrase, which was a Buddhist phrase, which was saying, you know, imagine that today is your last day, because if you if you were to imagine it's your last day, then you would you would enjoy every moment of that day. You would you, that it would be like a butterfly, where where one day in a butterfly's life seems like. Nothing to us, but but for them is is you know a big chunk of their lifetime. It's like you would focus on everything. You would find beauty in everything. You would get in touch with everybody you love, and we don't because we don't think that way. We just let time just go by without accounting for it, without paying attention to it. But brother, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, which has been on my mind, is that um, I don't know that quite a few times Tikhnatan's been asked about reincarnation, 
And he never seems to have really addressed that. And I'm, I'm really intrigued in that because, I, you know, in lots of religions, there's this idea that if you live a good life now, then you will sort of uh, go forth into the heaven or hell, whatever, depending on the life you've lived, which in a sense always is about only acting in the way you are now in order to get some benefit or avoid some suffering in the future. Whereas for me, Ty is always about the present moment. So, so what does he does he believe he's going to be reincarnated? What's his? Why has he never really made this? Because in, in in lots of Buddhist teachings, this is quite a core part. Yeah, that's a tricky question, and I will say that um, because that is a view that that's a view that can also be quite. Uh, dangerous in a way if you believe in your reincarnation later then in a way it goes against our practice of learning to live deeply in the present moment but here's the insight about reincarnation that tai has offered us with this um this notion of i am i want to do good so that i have something better in the future this is in a way, this is also popular Buddhism. I, I also believe that when I was growing up as a young um, Vietnamese, growing up in Canada, I was told, if you do good, when you die, you go to heaven. Um, I remember eating rice and my uh, my mom and my auntie always made me clean up everything in the bowl or else I will, in Vietnamese you say, mang toi, you will have and a fault that later on you have to repent for. And they used to say that if you don't finish all the rice, when you go to hell, when you die, you have to eat that, all that rice grain becomes um, maggots and you have to eat it. Yeah, it's a nasty view. <laughs> but it gives, it gives you this, this fear. It inserts you yeah. this fear of like, oh man, I got to eat this. And like, if you be evil, then later on when you go to hell, you will suffer 10 times more than what you're doing. So it's nothing wrong about this teaching. It can be a means to help people review and reflect on how they're living their life now. So maybe in the future, you don't want that suffering that you're offering and that the life that you are giving away. And that equals into karma. We use this language a lot in Buddhism, karma. Um, good karma, bad karma, karma always comes around. You can't escape it. That is true. Um, but here, karma translated into English, karma means action. And our practice is to be aware of our action so that it can be a reincarnation into something meaningful and beautiful and as a legacy. And in Buddhism, we speak about three actions. Our thoughts, that's an action already. If you have a thought that is beautiful and joyful, you benefit from that. You feel peaceful, you feel alive, you feel happy. Your mental state is being nourished. And then your words, what you say already is an action you know that words have a lot of power. It has a lot of effect. If you can offer loving kindness as in terms of words, they can benefit so much people. The way you share and guide can be more compassionate. It may have a more of a better effect than punishment. Sometimes we words hurts like knives stabbing into our hearts and those knives can stay for a very long time and it can wound us, it can bleed us each day, drain our energy. And sometimes our practice is learning to even remove these knives that we have received from people around us, even our parents. And so this insight, it tells us that our action, just by words, can have such an impact that is also a reincarnation. That is also a new manifestation. And the third action is our bodily action, what we do each day, the way we cook the food, how we offer it. If we are someone who has a lot of space, we want to give more. We like to donate. We like to offer to those who are suffering. 
we know that for a fact that um, sometimes the more you give, the more you receive in terms of of happiness. And we know that uh, when we express something um, with love and with um, generosity, people offer us gratitude. That gratitude is also a kind of nourishment. And we can say that is a good karma that we receive. So for our teaching and our insight is that the reincarnation is happening in every moment. Some reincarnation we receive right away. Let's say after we finish this podcast, like normal, we feel, wow, it wasn't as bad as we thought. And we have this relief of, oh, that was so great, right? Yeah. And, and we feel like this, this, this energy of, of, um, of strength and this energy of refreshness. And then some karma comes much later on. Um, my father um, told me that his teacher... Uh, sowed the seed in him when he left Vietnam as a boat person. He said, if you make it to the West, look for Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. And he gave my father this, uh, this seed, this karma. Wow, I've never heard you say that before, brother. That's in 1987. Amazing. Wow. And only in 1990, when Thay and Sister Jiang Kang first came to Toronto, that that karma came into fruit. As a reincarnation, Thai fi- my father finally met Thai and Sister Chiang Kong. And that, that seed, that action could have just died out, meaning maybe um, my father maybe didn't like Thai's teaching or Thai's Dharma and I knew something, he would look for something else. But that words that uh, that monk gave my father manifested into him coming to Plum Village and then later bringing his children and then I became a monk. And so this karma is still blossoming in a way, you know, so this reincarnation of just that one action now present, I'm offering this podcast. <laughs> so there are so many ways of looking at reincarnation. And for the Plum Village tradition, you can believe in it or you may not want to believe in it, but what we know for a fact is actions does come with consequences and they can be they can arrive at beautiful energies or they can also come back at something that may harm us or may haunt us later so brother there are a few things in that um i'd like to pick up but one is um what i hear you saying and and of course we keep coming back to this point because we keep having to be reminded of it is that what you're saying is rather than see the way you act now as affecting what will happen after you die is see what you're doing now in terms of its impact on your life right now and the people around you. And that brings the energy back to saying, actually, forget about the future. This is the life. This is the moment you're having an impact on people's lives. This is the moment you can either say something generous to someone, which will cause them to smile and to open and to feel good about themselves. Or this is the moment where you, as you say, you fire an arrow in their heart and they they shrink and they feel that life's not worth living, that we we have the, that capacity to do that in the present moment. And so every time we make a choice, every time we feel angry and we feel, we catch ourselves and say, rather than acting that out, I will actually do something else. That is where life becomes transformational and we don't need to worry about what happens after our so-called death. Exactly. Brother, the other, the other thing, um, I think there's something interesting, just pick up one aspect of that again, is that, so, so we, I, I think there's this belief in the world that what counts is our actions that are seen, that I actually do something, someone sees me do it, I get I, someone says, hey, Joe, great, you did that or whatever, that, that we have this notion that our physical actions, what we manifest directly physically in the world matters, but our thoughts don't. Mm. And, and uh, because no one sees them and we can have all these horrible thoughts and, but because no one sees them, actually, you know, it's cool. No, no, you know, not, they, they have no impact. But actually, one of the things I've learned is that actually... And, and as you describe, and as Ty described, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about it, is that a thought, even if nobody ever knows you had that thought, 
that thought has an impact in the world. Mm. And if everybody is starting to have negative thoughts, but acting kind, actually what you're driving is negativity. And, um, and one of the ways I, that sort of really hit home was when I interviewed Sister Chanduk, who's the, one of the longest serving nuns in Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition. And I asked her, uh, this was a year ago when she was, I think, around 70 years old. And I said, you know, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And she said something to the effect of, I want to be the best person I can be. And and But when she described it, she talked about cleansing her mind, cleansing her her way of being. And she talked about saying, it doesn't matter if anyone knows everyone sees I'm doing that everyone knows I'm doing that because actually the way I am the way my thoughts are actually contribute to the collective consciousness and I I I I was really that sort of really hit me because it's like our thoughts do matter yes they drive us to take action into words or physical action and a part of Buddhism is learning to understand your mind more because the Buddha has taught us that the mind creates the world. Of course, the world is as it exists. But if your mind is carried away by worries and fears, then you cannot arrive in the present moment. You're living in your own little world, whatever it may be. And so part of meditation and part of our training is learning to come back more and more to our mind to see what seeds are we nourishing in buddha psychology in the plum village um, part of the plum village school is we learn about the 51 mental formations we all have so many seeds that are sown in us when we are alive seeds of fear seeds of anger seeds of hatred seeds of jealousy greed and we have some neutral seeds, and we also have some very wholesome seeds, compassion, peace, joy, happiness, generosity, and the list goes on. Please, you can find this list on the Plum Village website. Um, and some of us, some, the way, like I shared, the way we are brought up, the conditions that are around us will strengthen particular seeds in us. We may have some fear um, for example, I I noticed when I was growing up um, because my parents uh, lived uh, were were born and raised during the war, so not having enough food was a real fear. Like just to make sure that on the table there's enough rice for the whole household. So I remember growing up, I always made sure I ha- always had to have more than enough in order to feel safe. And one day as a monk, um, we are taught moderation and we're taught don't eat with your eyes. Um, yeah, no, sometimes don't eat with the greed inside of you, but learn to have moderation because you're retraining what is enough. And I started to recognize this seed of fear of never having enough. And I can connect it to the roots of my parents' suffering. And that is a part of your consciousness that becomes a part of your mind. So you have store consciousness, which are things that are sometimes we. It looks like the basement, and then you have your mind consciousness, which is like everything that manifests in your energy, in your way you look at me, in the way I look at others, the way um, you're expressing yourself. That can be a lot of mind consciousness, and then you also have a middle layer. It's called manas. And manas doesn't have the insight of um, enough. It belongs to more of wanting more, greed. It's your temptation, your desire. And so a part of it is to tame the mind, to learn to understand the mind more. And how do you understand the mind? You have to go inwards. The way out is in. <laughs> and a part no of No advertising it, allowed. Not, not advertising. We're not sponsored. <laughs> um, the part of our, of our practice is to look at the mind. And sometimes that can be very scary because our mind can be very noisy. It can be um, overwhelmed with negative thoughts. 
It can be overwhelmed with um, violence. It can be overwhelmed by um, sexual temptation. Um, and it takes time to to filter our mind, to allow new images, new experiences to come. And a part of, of our training is not to say, ah, that is negative, that is bad, cut it away. No, no, that is already a part of you. Accept it, embrace it. If you know that because of this, these images of this experience that you have had, such as watching so much pornography growing up, I was... Uh, I grew up in Canada and I remember um, being introduced to pornography at a very young age that has such an impact on me. And it made the way I look at women, the way I look at advertisement, it, it always triggered this sexual desire. And I had to take time to identify the sexual energy, identify the images, the sounds that I have heard, and to filter it out in a way by not watering those seed. And luckily the training that I receive is the monastic training and my environment is very supportive of that. And you have to have Dharma um, trainings as well as precepts or what we say mindfulness training. So you know that if, if you want to be free from this desire, you have to train yourself not to get drowned in these images and these sounds. And that's a discipline in itself because a part of our desire may want to, we may be addicted to it. And sometimes by ourselves, it may not be helpful. We, uh, we, we may not have enough strength. And that's why we need communities, we need supports. So coming back to the mind, that's why the thoughts needs to be looked at and transformed. We call it transformation at the base, which is our mind. And we know that someone who has a very dangerous mind can bring a lot of harm to the earth, to humanity. And in history, we've had those figures. Hitler was one of them. Just this idea, a view, that is a thought, led us to World War II and to so much suffering. And someone who, with a compassionate mind like the Buddha, has allowed the world to be taught compassion, love. And that mind is so powerful. It has lasted over 2,600 years, transmitted from generations to generation. So you can see that the mind is a big energy of the world. Thank you, brother. And um, earlier you were talking about um, about our actions in the world, which brings us to the fifth remembrance. So you, you gave us the first four. Um, so why don't we dive into the fifth, which is all about um, our influence in the world, not just in our life, but after our death. So can you read it for us, brother, and give us a sort of a, a sense of it? The fifth remembrance. My actions are my only true belongings. I cannot escape the consequences of my actions. My actions are the ground upon which I stand. So everything that we say has our signature. Every step that we take bears our signature because that's our action. Every act of kindness is becomes our legacy. Every act of violence and hatred also is our legacy. So we can see that we don't stop manifesting after our body doesn't exist anymore because we know that deep down the fact is we will decompose, right? Back to the earth. That is a part of life. So with this insight, it's not to make us fearful, but it's to give us power to give us understanding that every action that we offer will be the continuation of who we are. And this is to go beyond the form. So we've been learning about 
different bodies that we have as a human. So we have the human body, which we get to experience life. And then in the Dharma world, in the meditation school, we have a Dharma body, the practice body, the spiritual home, which becomes alive once you take a mindful in-breath, mindful out-breath, once you practice walking meditation, once you practice the mindfulness trainings, which is our precept body. And then we have a sangha body, a community body, or translated into modern day, a family body. Your children also are you. You are part of your ancestors. So the way you live can be what you offer to the next generation. And then we have another body in the Buddhist world. We have the Buddha body, the awakened mind. And that's the good news that we all have this seed as one of the mental formation of waking up, being alive, being liberated. And then there are the bodies that we don't see, such as words. Sometimes um, we may write something and that is not the form of Fabhu, but someone receives that that is another form of Fabhu. That's another way of expressing yourself. And so, you know, sometimes um, before you send that email, Take a few mindful in-breath and out-breath before you press send. You know, are you sure you want to say that? Are you sure you want to offer that input? Or can you rephrase it in a more compassionate, in a more um, community building than just punishing? You know, so there are so many ways of our contribution that will go beyond us. And um, brother, you know... Um one of the things that has helped me start to uh, release my fears around death is this idea, as you say, of continuation. And, and following uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's recent death, I mean, a lot of the conversation, a lot of what people have been talking about is how to be Thai's continuation. Because what I understand is that all the actions we take in the world, all the thoughts we have, all the ideas we have, actually have an impact on all those around us. And, and the impact we have on the people around us will change them in some way, and then will lead to them responding to the people around them with their thoughts and ideas and actions, which will in turn, it's, it's a bit like dropping a, a pebble in the water and, and it and the sort of echoes of that wave, the sort of ripples go out to eternity. So if I impact one person's life in some either very ugly or some beautiful way, that will affect the way they treat all the people they know. And that will affect those people. So actually, the way we are in our life continues into eternity at some level. And it means that actually, this idea that we don't that when we die, it doesn't just stop. Actually, throughout our entire life, our actions, thoughts, feelings are having an impact, are changing the world, are continuing. And, and obviously, some of that is very direct, isn't it? It's with, if we have children, um, we see that very much, and our grandchildren, that, that's one very direct way. That's, a, that's an easy way to understand. But it's like a teacher who teaches kids, the way they teach those children will either inspire them or or close them down. They're the way they'll either be punished or loved. Um, and that one teacher's life, even if they were to pass, the emanation of their teachings will go out. And if they teach a thousand kids in their lifetime, only a thousand kids, that can have an impact over millions of people. So that has really helped me to understand that actually when I die, I know that while I will be buried or uh, cremated or whatever, that actually I will continue in many, many different forms. Yes, this insight can help us uh, be free from the notion of non-existent. And this is where this famous calligraphy and teaching of Tai is a cloud never dies because the cloud in its form will just transform into another manifestation such as rain or snow and when the rain falls into the earth it will penetrate into the grounds it may nourish the trees 
So the new manifestation of the cloud will be the tree, or it will come into the river and it will nourish the life of the river. So it is a constant continuation. And this um, insight can really help us just be more free and allow us to experience life more deeply because you know that every moment is a moment of continuation. And this has um, this insight also has has helped me live also more deeply with um, sometimes I, I invite my, um, my ancestors into the present moment because even though they are not here, um, but they, my grandmother just passed away um, last year and one of her dreams was to come to Plum Village, France to visit me um, because she's never been um, in Plum Village and never seen me as a monk in, in this community. But now that she's not here and I can, I can uh, be regretful and saying, oh, I should have put more effort. I should have um, tried to create more conditions so that she can arrive in France, et cetera, et cetera. And I can replay this story over and over and over. And every time I do that, I have guilt. I have shame. I have a feeling of I wasn't a good grandson. But now that she is not here, with this insight, she is now me. And my presence here, I can invite her because a part of her is very clearly in me because she gave birth to my mother and my mother gave birth to me. And so I am her continuation. Sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit not grounded, I would say, grandmother, take, take a step in, be here with me. And I would invite her to walk with me. And I can invite her to be present, to live in this land of France, Southern France. Enjoy the, the miracles that is here, the sunflowers, um, the oak trees. Enjoy the plum trees that tie in, the community has planted. So this insight can also free us to see that when someone is not there anymore, you have to have the eye of interbeing, the eye of signlessness. You see them in a new manifestation. And this is a reality now for a lot of us who are students of Thai, who our teacher is not here anymore physically. But if you say that, oh, I'm so unlucky. If only I've made more effort to be with him when he was alive, then you would just live in regret. But Tai has taught us to be free from that. Now to see Tai in his new forms. He has given us so many teachings that becomes our Dhamma body. That is the Tai in us. The way we breathe, if we breathe mindfully, ah, that is Tai. I remember um, one time in the US, um, it may be his last US tour in 2013. And Tai said, on the last day of the retreat, if you miss me and you want to be close to me, just take a mindful in-breath and a mindful out-breath and Tai is there. If you miss me, invite Tai to walk with your footstep. Each mindful step that you take, Tai is there. And I know that this is a teaching, but you can practice it. You can really feel it. And we as a community has been coming together for the last uh, seven weeks on many occasions um, to celebrate Thai's life, to mourn together, to cry together, to hug each other, but at the same time to celebrate, to honor Thai's teaching, but not as a way of putting it on a pedestal, but bringing it into our daily life. And we've done it in such joyful ways, retreats, singing, being, storytelling, Daffodil Festival. So there's just so much way. And if we, we see that all of these celebration is a manifestation of Thai. So if we have someone so dear to us, these practices, these memorial services, these remembering of them is also a way of letting them be alive in your life. And, and Thich Nhat Hanh is a wonderful example of that in the sense of, you know, yes, at one level, his body 
has gone. Mm -hmm. But he's so present. I mean, and, you know, and you can see him in so many different places. It's in his books. It's in his Dharma teachings online. It's in his, uh, his students. It's in the, all the thousands of people that that wrote in to say how Thai had given given either saved their lives. I mean, we had Christiana Figueres just a few weeks ago saying that uh, Thai had literally saved her life when she was in in a deeply painful place. So, so to say that Thai is gone is true, but actually isn't true at all. He's very very present. But brother, one one thing I'd like to go on to is a sort of is the deep teaching of no birth and no death. Because on, in a sense, on a relative level, people die; they're born and they die. You see that physically, so that seems to be true. But Thai teaches on the sort of ultimate level. Yes, there's no such thing. How can that possibly be true? Tell our what, 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 our, what can our readers make of the idea that no there's birth no and birth no and death. no death? Like, come on, Fapu, be serious. What's all that about? That is uh, to continue the teachings of manifestation. Um, we're always changing, so we are always born. Every morning we wake up, <laughs> twenty-four brand new hours. That's a moment. If we if we realize that we've been sleeping our whole life. We want to wake up today. That can be a new birth, and we may wake up, but then we fall back to normal habits, and then we need a reminder. We wake up again. That's one example. Another insight that we have is Tai Tai would tell us, you know, our cells are always dying and being reborn. That means that we're always changing. We're con we're we're in this constant river. Of change, time is a concept of mind, and we are always just going to flow. And for us to be free from this idea of of being stuck as this is who we are, that's not the reality, because the fap who yesterday is not exactly the same today, but it's not exactly different from yesterday. So this gives us the insight that in the present moment, yesterday carries the past, but the now is creating the future. So we are dying and being reborn, and dying and being reborn at every moment in life. And this is another insight in the ultimate dimension that we see that birth and death comes and go. And that may help us be free of this idea of non-existent. That one day we will not be there anymore, because, like we have been sharing, our next birth may be a manifestation of the act of kindness that we gave. That's why Tai tells us: don't underestimate an act of kindness. Don't underestimate an act of mindfulness. Because that can be reborn into someone else, and they can grow that love. They can grow that kindness. They can grow that generosity, and also don't underestimate an act of hate, because that hatred that we offer can that can dig deep into someone's mind and someone's heart, and one day they can offer that again, and that's a samsara, a cycle of hatred. And because life and death alternates, it comes and it goes, and it's opposite of each other. It means that they always exist together. If there is birth, there has to be death, and if there is death, there will be birth. So don't be sorrow, don't be sorrowful, if there will be death, because there may be birth again. So this is a teaching that not only in Buddhism, look at nature. Nature teaches us. If we live in a country where there's four seasons, you see the coming and going of the leaf of a tree. And you may ask that um, that leaf if it was afraid, but he say, he say no, because once it was uh, manifested on the branch, it enjoyed being the leaf. It enjoyed being a shade 
for those who come to take refuge. And when the time comes, he knows to let go, and the leaf, he or she or they, will fall down into the earth and will nurture the earth for the new manifestation of the next seasons of leaf. So we can learn from nature also no birth and no death. Yeah, and that, and that we are part of a continuum that's gone back from millions and billions of years. I mean, we, we, are, we are part of that river of consciousness and evolution. And that what we can offer the world is to be our best self. And that as part of that stream, that if we're, if everyone is their best possible self and is really mindful and really aware and acts, thinks and feels in a way that is as positive as they can manage, that that creates a more beautiful world. Mm. It's and, and not to see our life as a sort of separate moment that doesn't have a before, doesn't have an after. It's like we we are aware of that, but we live in the present moment and that heals the past and transforms the future. Exactly. And from time to time, you know, part of our training is we would meditate on our own death. So you would practice and you would sit down or even lay down. When I practiced this, I, I was laying down and I can envision myself um, laying on a bed. And for me, I visualize uh, the the closest people that were meaningful to my life around my bed. And I can say that I have lived a very meaningful life. And then you can see, meditate on your body, disintegrating, no sound, no sight, no taste. And you can see that you will become ash, nothing and just return back to the earth. And I remember when I practiced this, and this was a few years ago, I woke up with tears. <laughs> Not woke up, but I got out of the meditation with tears and I just saw how life is so fragile. And I saw that I am so fragile and that I just want to live life more deeply, more meaningful. And uh, when that time comes, there will be no regret. And um, this allows us to practice acceptance more because we know that w when that time comes, we will grow ill. And if we have lived a very deep and meaningful life, you will accept illness much more easily. And when the moment comes to really let go of life, you can do it gracefully and with gentleness. And I was in Vietnam um, a few weeks ago um, with the honor of receiving Thai's ashes in urns to bring back to Plum Village, France. And I, I went with a delegation. And when I was in Vietnam for a very short period, I wanted to hear the stories of the close attendance of Thai, of how Thai's last few days were. And I had this uh, conversation with this sister who I'm very close to. And I said, sister, please tell me, how was it? And she said, you know, the last 48 hours, Tai had a shine in his eyes. And his energy of presence was so alive. And he looked at life with a sense of, of beauty, a sense of this has been a wonderful journey. And she said that he would look at the trees, at the students in a very different way. She said, it's so hard to explain, but there was something so unique about it. And then when the moment came, Tai fully let go. And one of the attendant brothers who I spoke to, who I was um, sharing the room with for the eight days that I was there. So after Tai has passed, normally they, they have these... Um, ointments to, to massage the body. Because sometimes when people uh, pass away, they would um, stiffen up. their all like rigor mortis. The, yes, and all the muscle would be really stiff. And you would have to massage it so it is relaxed. And they had the, um, they had the, the, the ointments. And when, but when they touched Tai's body, 
Thai was so relaxed. It was like Thai has let go fully. There's nothing that Thai is holding onto life. Thai is now free. That was the sense. And during the memorial services, we were privileged to see Thai's body lying on the bed. And for me, I saw that Thai was still so beautiful, <laughs> and it just looked like Thai was sleeping so gently, laying there. And I can see that um, Thai has really returned to Mother Earth with nothing um, holding on to, clinging on to life, and. My own personal experience uh, during the time that I was attending him, especially after the stroke, I saw that Thai accepted the illness. He accepted not being able to speak, but then he was able to communicate in a different way. He wasn't able to walk anymore, but he was able to be present with the sangha very deeply, and we were able to continue to be in his. Refuge of his dharma body, his virtue body, his teaching body of just presence, and this is all an encouragement for all of us that uh, even when we arrive at that moment, we can still accept it with wholeness and learn to be happy in that present moment. And that's what I've learned in since 2014, since the stroke. I've learned Thai practice of accepting being one with the new manifestation, the forms that Thai had to accept, and that was a teaching for me. It reminds me, brother, of this phrase um, I was once told, which which was deeply meaningful at the time, and it was saying, "Being honest means not having to remember what you said." And and it's that sense because if you've been honest, you don't have to. If you if you've been dishonest, you're constantly having to remember what you were dishonest about. Whereas if you're honest, you can let everything go. Mm. And you know, I've felt for a long time that, you know, when people said, "What's your aspiration?" One of my aspirations is to die well. Mm. And which and what you're saying exactly what I've sort of learned as an idea rather than done yet. It's to die well. You have to have lived well. Mm. And so you can't wait until the day of your death to live, to to live, or to forgive yourself or whatever, because it, it doesn't happen that way. But mm. if we live a life that in the present, each present moment, to the extent we can, that we live free, we live open, we live vulnerable, we live honest, we live loving, compassionate, caring to the extent we can, is the extent to which we're going to have a good death. Because as you say, Thai had this extraordinary life. And it was constant transformation, letting go. So to, at the point of his death, what you're saying is that he was already free. Yes. And therefore, he, you, we don't need to worry about what happens to him, whether he, he comes into another form. Or whatever. It's just he, he did the work. And that should be his true inspiration to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a contemplation on no coming and no going. And uh, this was um, written by Tai. So please allow me to read it. Contemplation on no coming, no going. This body is not me. I am not limited by this body. I am life without boundaries. I have never been born, and I have never died. Look. At the ocean and the sky filled with stars, manifestations from my wondrous true mind. Since before time, I have been free. Birth and death are only doors through which we pass. Sacred threshold on our journey. Birth and death. Are a game of hide and seek. So laugh with me, hold my hand. Let us say goodbye. Say goodbye to meet again soon. We meet today. We will meet again tomorrow. 
We will meet at the source every moment. We meet each other in all forms of life. Thank you, brother. And um, we traditionally finish our episodes with a short guided meditation. So, brother, if you're able to do that for us now, and then we can wish our listeners goodbye. So, dear friends, whether you're going for a walk, going for a jog, or on a commute, wherever you may be, if you can allow yourself to be still, if you're standing grounded on your two feet, or if you're sitting, sit relaxingly, feeling your two feet on the ground. You may rest your hands and palms on your thighs. Become aware of your body. If there's any tension, just relax your body from your face, your head, your shoulders, your upper body, your arms. Wiggle your fingers if you need to and release it. Let it rest. Feel, feel your grounds, your two feet. And now become aware of your in-breath, breathing in. This is life. Breathing out, I am alive. In breath, this is life. Out breath, I am alive. Breathing in, I am joyful that I am alive. Breathing out, I live deeply this moment of life. In the joy of life, out, I am grateful to life in me and all around me. Breathing in, I'm aware of the nature of growing old. Breathing out, I know I will not escape growing old. Breathing in, I am grateful to the energy of life I have. Breathing out. I vow to live deeply with life. Breathing in, I know I am of the nature to get sick. Breathing out, I know I cannot escape sickness. In aware that I am of the nature to get sick, out I cannot escape. I'm aware that I am healthy now and I want to live and enjoy my health and as well as nourish my wellness every day so I don't regret when I cannot walk anymore. I cannot hold a cup of tea anymore. Let us enjoy the simple things of life.
breathing in. I am of the nature to die. Breathing out, I know that I cannot escape death. In, I am aware that I am of the nature to die. Out, I can't escape. Let us be aware of the nature of impermanence. Give rise to the mindfulness of living deeply so that when death comes, we can let go with a smile on our face. Breathing in all that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. Breathing out, there is no way to escape being separated from them. In everyone I love, out. One day, we all will say goodbye. Let us love each other more deeply, be compassionate toward one another, forgive more each day, so that our time together can be meaningful, and when the time comes, we are happy to let go. Breathing in, my actions are my true belongings, body, speech, and mind. I cannot escape the consequences of my actions. Breathing out, my actions are the ground upon which I stand. Our continuation is beyond form, our legacy. Let us leave behind what will nourish this planet, what will nourish our loved ones our descendants into the future. A small act of kindness, a small act of generosity, even an act of forgiving can change someone. Breathing in, I am alive now, Breathing out, I will be alive, continuing into the future. Breathing in, aware of life inside of me, I smile. Breathing out, aware of life all around me, I smile. I smile to the miracle of life. Thank you, dear listeners, dear friends, for joining us. And we hope to see you in the future. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can listen to many more. You can find The Way Out is In episodes on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on other platforms that carry podcasts, and on our own Plum Village app. And this podcast was brought to you by the generous donors of the Thich Han Foundation. If you would like to support future episodes of the podcast and the work of the international Plum Village community, please visit www. 
tnhf.org slash donate. Thank you, everyone, and be well. See you. Bye. The way out is in. Oh.